Hello, and welcome to SoberCast, where we provide AA speaker meetings and workshops in podcast format. We're an ad-free podcast, and if you enjoy listening, please help us be self-supporting by visiting SoberCast.com, look for the donate link, and drop a dollar or two into our virtual basket. We hope you enjoy the podcast. Have a great day. Good evening. My name's Kip, and I'm an alcoholic, and I ain't had a drink all day long. Didn't hurt nobody today. Didn't hurt myself. Um, I worked all week and paid my way. My wife is with me tonight, and uh, we're in love with each other. I haven't had to say I'm sorry almost a week. <laughs> when I pull into my house, my, my kids come running out of the house, you know. And they say, Daddy's home. When I pull into my yard, all the neighbors, they wave at me. Uh, that might not mean much to a lot of you, but uh, I'll tell you what, it sure does tickle my mother. <laughs> <laughs> I am so impressed and I'm so honored to be here tonight. Um, I, I knew about Mar for quite a while. I've been coming to Atlanta with different... Uh, aspects of Alcoholics Anonymous for quite a few years, and, I, and I've met many, many people who have graduated from MAR and that were in MAR, and I've always been impressed by the quality of their sobriety and the way they carried themselves. I mean, there was something special going on here. I had the honor of getting to know Art over the last few years, and I just want to tell you what a blessing that has been. He, he is a member of our family. He's on my speed dial. I live in California, and I, I talk with Art on a regular basis because he's a man. He's a real man. And, he, you know, he, he suits up and he shows up and he does what he's supposed to do and he takes care of his family and he honors his commitments. We have a, a deal in California that I copied from the... I stole it from Georgia. It was too good to keep just here. We we stole a little piece of the rock and moved it out to California and we started dealing on Art honors us. Just about every every one of our rocks, and he comes and closes our deal with amazing grace. And uh, he's quite a singer. You ought to hear him sometime. But I've been asked to share my experience, strength, and hope with you. And you know, and I was okay with it until I heard about all them judges that were here. <laughs> Made me a bit nervous, you know. You know, I get asked to talk a lot, and I have a little bit of a sordid background. Anytime anyone asks me to come to some other state, I'm always thinking it's probably some kind of a sting thing, you know? <laughs> I don't think I owe Georgia anything, but that federal judge scared me. <laughs> <laughs> I'd like you to know that I have complete amnesty. I hope. <laughs> my father's Irish and Sioux. My mother's Irish and Cherokee. And my daddy liked to drink and my mama liked to fight, you know. And I'll share in a real general way what that was like, you know. We'd be waiting for the old man to come home. And the later it got, the tenser it got in that house. And after a while, you'd hear that pickup coming up the road, bouncing off the curbs, you know. And you looked out the window, you'd see all the neighbors turning off their lights and coming outside with their lawn chairs. <laughs> He'd open that door and fall out of the truck, and my mom would hit that screen door and be chasing him around the yard with the butcher knife, and the show had begun. And that was just an average night, you know, that wasn't anything special. Now, none of that makes me an alcoholic. If anything in the world, my father, he taught me exactly what I didn't want to be. I had no illusions about alcohol. I saw what alcohol did to the marriage, what it did to the children, what it did to his career. I wanted nothing to do with it. And I swore to God I'm never going to be the kind of man he was. You know, so I cannot blame my alcoholism on my father. I've always liked to blame it on the San Diego Unified School District. 
they had this great idea in the early 60s to bring in the young people of San Diego, the young, and they took us in these rooms and um, they showed us these movies and they had these people come up and talk about the stuff we don't talk about in AA, mostly marijuana and things like that. And they showed us the deal, they turned the lights on and I hit my buddy Balto in the ribs and I said, hey Balto, can you get some of that? He said, oh, yeah, my dad smokes that stuff. And uh, I said, cool, you know. And so he says, I'll see you after school tomorrow. So I met him the next day at school. I said, did you get it? He goes, yeah, meet me after school. So we went after school. I said, so what do we do? He said, we got to go boost some wine. I said, some wine? What for? He says, I don't know, but my, my daddy always drinks cheap wine with this stuff. You know, we didn't want to make any mistakes. <laughs> We went in this little market, and I boosted my uh, my very first bottle of port wine. And uh, we went down this little canyon, and he fired this cigarette up, and I took a drag off of it and started coughing my brains out. And I looked at the stuff in the jug; it was kind of purple, and I pulled off that fancy screw cap, and I took a pull on it, you know, and it just jumped right out of me. But I ain't no quitter, you know. <laughs> And I took another pull off that jug, man, and it kind of did a yo-yo on me. You know, it'd be go about halfway down, and you have to pinch your nose. And I got it down, and then I got the next one down. And after about the fourth one, it was just sliding down. And I finished my bottle, and I said, Balta, are you going to drink that? He goes, man, that stuff is vile. I said, well, you can have the rest of that cigarette, but I'll take that. And he said, you go ahead. And I drank his. And it was a beautiful day that day. And I leaned back after I finished that last jug, and I, I looked up at the sky. I put my hands behind my back, and I was just standing there looking at the clouds. And, and I experienced my very first spiritual awakening. I'm an alcoholic. Alcohol does something to me that it doesn't do to other people that are not alcoholic. I lived in a neighborhood... There was all first-generation Hispanic. Nobody spoke English. My cousins are all a very dark skin, dark hair, dark brown eyes. And as long as I can remember, if I went outside of the house, the Mexicans wanted to beat my ass. And if I stayed in the house, the Indians wanted to beat my ass. <laughs> and I stood in that doorway in terror many, many days. And I grew up that way in absolute terror. There was always something was getting ready to jump off, in or out. It didn't make no difference. But I noticed for the first time in my life when I was laying on that bank after I put this magic elixir in my body that the fear was gone. The terror was gone. And I felt like a whole human being for the very first time in my life. And I was at peace with myself. And I was enough for the very first time. And I immediately with no reservation, turned my will and life over to that, and I never looked back. I knew all about Alcoholics Anonymous, the first three steps of a long time before I met Alcoholics Anonymous. I knew that I was powerless over this world. And I knew my life was unmanageable. And I drank this magic elixir. And I came to believe that there was a power greater than myself that could restore me to sanity. And I never looked back. A couple of years later, you know, I got kicked out of school for hitting a teacher for the second time. He was, was a, you guys understand, a series of bad breaks and misunderstandings. And uh, I left. And my mother, when I got home, my mother had found this contraband. And she, my mother, I got the greatest mom in the world. She's probably one of the meanest women in North America. <laughs> But I love her to death, and I respect her. I watched her stick my dad with a knife about three different times in my life, and I, I saw her knock out the next-door neighbor one time with a shovel for talking back to her. <laughs> and I learned at an early age, when my mother tells you to do something, you say, yes, ma'am, and you do it. There is no hesitation. She doesn't negotiate. And she just looked at me, and she goes, what's this? And I said, it's dope. And she said, what's it doing in my house? I said, it's mine. She goes, you get out of my house. And I said, yes, ma'am. She had that look. And I hooked him up. I just turned 13 years old. 
And I'd never been anywhere, done anything. I went over to a little town next door, Carlsbad, California, and I, I was talking to a buddy of mine. I said, he said, so what you going to do? I said, I don't know. He goes, well, check this out. And he opens up this newspaper and he says, look, all these people, they're, just, they're going up to San Francisco and, and all they do is get high and listen to music and make love. I like music, you know. <laughs> I got on a road, I hitchhiked up there, I had eight cents in my pocket, and I landed in a little place called Haight-Ashbury of San Francisco in the very early 60s, and they were right, there was lots of music there, and um, I'll share in a very, very general way about that experience, I've always been grateful to God of my understanding that I'm not allergic to penicillin. <laughs> I was a lousy hippie, man. I was, I, I was probably the worst hippie that ever got to San Francisco. You know, I, I grew hair real good. But I've been fighting all my life, you know, and these people were pacifists. And I just wasn't getting it, you know. Someone would say something to me and I'd knock them out. And uh, they were going, hey, give peace a chance. I'd go, hey, back off, you know. And, and I found out what my true calling was at an early age. I saw all these kids and they wanted this particular product. All of my friends come from Mexico. I know where this comes from. And I can put two to two together, and I call Balto. I said, Balto, check this out. And he goes, no kidding. He says, come on down. And I went down there, and we went down to Mexico, and we talked with his family, and we started a little business, and uh, worked out real good for a long time. And until I, when I was 16 years old, I was arrested in Mexico with 200 kilos of this particular contraband, and uh, they sentenced me to 25 years in prison at La Mesa Federal Penitentiary. And I doubt if most of you can imagine, but a Mexican penitentiary of maximum security is not a very friendly place to a 16-year-old white boy with long blonde hair. If anything in the world, that ought to top me, man. I need to change the way I'm living. But it actually, in all, it turned out to be the greatest career move of my life. Um... My buddy Balto was related to about half the people in this prison. And I found out that I'd been working for this family all along. And when they realized who I was, they immediately started protecting me. And I like, I love the United States, but I really like Mexico. It's very civilized. It works on the principle of mordida. And that means the little bite. And what that basically means, if you've got enough money, you can buy all the justice you want. And I like living in a place like that. Because we had to find out who, who had the power and how much it was going to cost. And it took about a year, and we got the money, and I was released with no charges. Everything was dropped against me. And I continued to doing what I was doing. I ran into this young gal, and um, I kept getting arrested about this time for just being stupid in public. Anybody ever been arrested just for being stupid in public? It's very humiliating. And I was arrested three times in one week for being stupid in public, and uh, this little girl kept bailing me out of jail. And uh, the third time she did it, I said, how come you keep bailing me out of jail? And she goes, looked at me with a stupid look on her face and just, well, what, what else would I do? And I said, I like the way you think, girl. Want to get married? <laughs> <laughs> and I married that girl. And uh, she was the greatest crime partner I've ever had in my life. She wasn't afraid of nothing. She'd do anything once. And uh, she backed my play right or wrong for many, many years. I got arrested again, and I did a little bit of time that I was on parole, and I got out, and I knew I was never going to make parole in California. I had this parole officer that was just not understanding at all. I, I walked into his cubicle the day I got out, and, and I sat down. He looked at me, and his face turned red. He said, who told you to sit down? I stood to my feet, and he's looking at my jacket, and he's going, this is a mistake. Who let you out of prison? 
And I started to say something. He said, shut up. He goes, you're going back, and I'm going to make sure that you do. You do not belong out here. So, with my keen alcoholic mind, I figured out how it all worked, and I got an uncle of mine that lived in Oregon to claim that he was really sick and he needed me to come up there, and he didn't have anyone else besides me. And I went through a whole bunch of a lawyer and got everything taken care of, and I got my case transferred to this little town in Oregon. And there was only 200 people there, and that parole officer was so mad. But I was gone. And uh, I met this new guy, and he said, well, just check in with me once a month. And uh, I said, oh, okay, cool. And, uh, and I, you know, I did a real quiet life. I just got real quiet. I got a job, and I just stayed out of trouble. I just wanted to get off parole so I could get back to California. And my wife, Kathy, uh, she got pregnant up there. And she said, come on, let's, we got to go to the hospital. We're going to have the baby today. You know, when I was a kid, I'd listen to other men talk about, young boys talk about what they wanted to be when they grow up. And they wanted to be firemen and policemen and judges. I don't know why, but... <laughs> all I ever wanted in my life was I wanted to be a father. And I can remember that when I was a little kid. I wanted to have a son. I wanted to have a, a child. I wanted to have a family. I wanted to have a woman that loved me. I wanted to have the neighbors wave to me. And I had another child, you see, that I didn't tell you about yet, but uh, I was arrested one other time. And I'd been living with a gal, and she was pregnant. And they took me away, and I was gone for a year. And when I got back, I couldn't find her, and I couldn't find the child. And there was this big void. I never heard if it was a boy or a girl or nothing. I never heard one thing. And there was this big empty hole in my gut. And we went to that hospital that day. And I waited out in this room. And they came back out. This nurse came out. And she brought this little baby out. And she put this baby in my arms. And I looked at this little boy. And my heart absolutely exploded. Something happened to me that had never happened to me in my life. And that was a feeling of absolute, total, unconditional love for another human being. I had never known that feeling. Never. And I'm holding on to this boy, and I'm promising him. I'm saying, you know what? You're going to be my pal. Nothing in this world is ever going to hurt you. You're never going to be afraid of nothing. I'll always be there. And I meant it with everything I had. You know, I got off parole up there, and we came back down to California now. About a year later, and we went to this other hospital, and I waited in this room, and they came out, and they brought this little girl, and they put her in my arms. And the same thing happened. My heart absolutely exploded. I fell in madly, madly in love with this little girl. I don't know if there's anyone else here like me, but I'm an alcoholic who thinks real fast. I've had to. I'm talking fast. I'm looking at this little girl, and it suddenly dawned on me that someone was going to want to marry her someday. They hadn't even weighed her yet. <laughs> and I'm thinking about what the conditions are going to have to be and where we're going to have the wedding and what I'm going to wear, what she's going to wear, what the qualities this guy's got to have. And they asked me for the baby, you know, and and just snapped me right out of it, you know, and I, and I gave back the little girl. But I had promised her. I said, you know, you're going to be my princess. You'll have everything. You'll never be in fear. I'll never let you down. And I meant it with everything I had. You know, alcohol and drugs were, they were fun back then. It was recreational, but I, I still had a choice. I had a choice of when I could drink and when I wanted to party. And I knew when I could stop. And everything in my life was really good. I'd made a lot of money in the business I was in. And I spent all my time with my children. 
I bathed him every morning. I cooked for him. I taught him how to walk. I taught him how to talk. My, my whole place was just like a playground for kids. And um, I spent all my time with my kids. September 6, 1976, my wife and my daughter had gone down. They were going school clothes shopping. School was about to start. And I was playing with my son out in the yard. And a friend of mine came over, and he brought this stuff over, and we smoked stun on it. And, uh, he left, and it was real hot that day. And I, I wanted a beer real bad. And I went in the house, and I didn't have any. And I didn't even think about it, you know. I didn't even think about it. I just got on my bike, and I, and I puttered up to the store, and uh, I got a six-pack of beer, and I came back down the road. And when I'm coming down the road, I see this big crowd of people in front of my house. I don't know what they're doing, you know, but I see the police are there and the fire department's there, and I wade through this crowd of people because I can't get in my driveway, and I found out that my son had chased me out of the driveway and had been run over by a truck. And my baby boy was laying there, and his head was split open, and I could see his brains. And there was bones protruding from everywhere. And a big piece of me died. You know, I, we got to the hospital, and I sat in that intensive care with him for nine months. And every day that I got there, the doctors would tell me to pray that he dies because there was so much brain damage. There was so much brain damage that there was absolutely nothing to hope for. And the kindest thing that could ever happen, that he would just die right there. And I wouldn't let go of him. I just kept touching him, and I kept massaging every muscle in his body just over and over and over and over all day, all night. I just couldn't stop, and I, I wouldn't leave until they'd make me leave. And I'm, I'm telling you that my son, his body survived. The little boy that I had was gone forever. And I got back a child that was uh, spent most of his life in and out of hospitals. He went through 27 major brain surgeries. He couldn't hear. He couldn't talk. Emotionally and mentally, he never got past the age of about four years old. And he had a lot of physical and a lot of emotional problems. And I, and I knew who was responsible for that. See, it was my job to be taking care of my son. And this was about the time that alcohol started changing for me. It was one of the first times that I got to get that look that alcoholics get to know so well of coming into the hospital and being too drunk and the look on the doctor's face telling me to get out and the humiliation and the shame. My son got out of there and he got in a special hospital and uh, things were starting to get real crazy in my life. I had to go make some money real fast and uh I put a little deal together. My brother Bill, I haven't talked much about it, but my brother Bill was, he was 11 months younger than me, and he was, we were Irish twins, and we had backed each other all of our life. Anything that I've told you that I've done, you know, my brother was right there with me all of our lives. And uh, my brother, he lived with us. I mean, my brother went on our honeymoon with us, you know. I mean, my brother never left my side. He was my partner and everything. And, uh, my brother had come down with a disease called schizophrenia. And my family had had him put in a hospital. And he called me one day. And he said, Kip, get me out of here, man. And I said, are you okay? He says, yeah, just get me out of here. Do whatever you got to do. Get me out of here. You know, and I went against my family's advice. And I went against the doctor's advice. And I got my brother out of there. And I brought him back home with me. And we continued to do what we were doing. And it was about time that I had to leave town because I had to go put some money together real quick. And I told my brother, I said, Bill, watch the kids. I'm going to be gone for three days. i got to go to New York. He says, you can't go. I said, what do you mean? He says, I don't know, man. He says, I'm coming apart. You can't go. And I said, Bill, you know the deal, man. You know i got to go. I ain't got no choice. Just watch the kids. I said, it's always been me and you. It always will be. I gave him a handful of money because money's fixed everything all my life. I said, you know, I'll be back in three days. Just hang, hang tough. And I got in this cab, and I looked at my brother, and he was standing in the driveway, and he was crying. I had never seen my brother shed a tear in his life. 
And I got back into doing this deal that I was doing, you know, and it went sideways. Instead of three days, I was gone for almost three weeks. When I got back, I, I went to my daughter, Jana. I said, Jana Marie, I said, where's your uncle? She goes, Daddy, I ain't seen him. I said, what do you mean you ain't seen him? She goes, I haven't seen him since you left. I took my daughter, and we went across across the creek where I lived. He had a mobile home over there. We walked over there, and I knocked on that door, and nobody answered. And I opened the door, and my brother's head rolled out and landed on my feet. Three days after I had left, my brother had pulled, taken a gun, and then he'd blown his head off because he couldn't go another day. And another big piece of me died. I don't tell you this because I want your sympathy or anything like that. The only th the reason I tell you this part of my story is I, I like to make something. In the big book of Alcoholics Anonymous in chapter 5, there's a little sentence in there that a lot of people go over real quick. It states that there are those among us who got here with grave emotional and mental disorders. And I am one of those people. Because at that time, when my brother hit my head, hit my feet, something inside of me snapped and it was like a branch breaking and you could hear it. And it was my very soul, my very psyche. It completely snapped in half. And I'll tell you this from my heart to yours. Maybe you don't understand, but I thank God that I'm an alcoholic. I thank God that alcohol does for me what it does for me. But if it wouldn't have been for alcohol at that point in my life, I guarantee you I would not be here today. Alcohol takes away pain from me. It takes away guilt. It stops the screaming in my head. It stops the voices in my head. It allows me to lay down and rest. It allows me to live in this world one day at a time reasonably comfortable. As long as I can keep enough alcohol in my body. I don't have to feel nothing. And I didn't want to feel nothing. Things started happening in my life, man. I became very dysfunctional. Um, I wasn't bringing any money anymore. Uh, my son was in a special hospital. My brother was gone. My wife was in her own pain with this. And she reacted the way she reacted. She left with another guy. I didn't blame her. She left me with my little girl when we were sitting there. My little girl was crying. She was five years old. She was crying. I said, what's the matter? She goes, Daddy, I'm scared. She goes, everybody's dying. Everybody's leaving. What's going on? And I said, baby, don't worry. We've had a rough break here, but we don't need nobody. I'm going to catch my breath here in just a minute, and we're going to go on. And I'm not, not going to let nothing happen to you. Don't worry. And about that time, a guy knocked on my door, and he brought this stuff in. I doubt if most of you in this room have heard of it, but I know there are some who have. In California, we call it Mad Dog 2020. <sighs> One of the greatest inventions of the 20th century, without a doubt. I'd never heard of it. I drank tequila, you know, but he brought this stuff in and I started drinking it. And the next thing I know, this lady is tapping me on the shoulder saying, excuse me, sir, you've got to get off the airplane. And I opened my eyes and I looked around and I'm on this big wide body jet. My little girl is sound asleep right next to me and this plane is completely empty except for me and her. And there was this lady looking at me with this real anguished look on her face. And I said, what? And she goes, you got to get off the plane. And I said, where am I? She says, you're in Fort Lauderdale. I said, I hate Fort Lauderdale. And she goes, I don't know nothing about it. you got to get off the plane. So I did the next indicated thing. I straightened my clothes, and I very carefully woke up my daughter and hoping that she was going to say something to let me know what we were doing there before I raised undue suspicion that I didn't have it together. And she opened her eyes, and she looked at me, and she goes, Are we there yet? I said, Yep, we're here. She goes, Oh, good. I said, Yeah, good. And uh, I didn't know what to do. I had a lot of money on me. And I called a cab. I said, take me to a hotel, a nice one, and I, you need to stop at a liquor store before we get there because I need to figure out what's happened here. And 
the next thing I know, I come to completely naked in four point restraints in this room. For just a second, I think I might have missed something really cool. <laughs> but then I saw that green institutional color that I know so well, and I knew that I'd been arrested for being stupid in public one more time. I found out what had happened. I talked to this doctor, and um, apparently I had met this young couple, and I was drinking tequila, and they had some of this marvelous Floridian additive. And you could really drink a lot with this stuff, and you know, and we started drinking, we started doing this other stuff, and, and I found out they'd never heard of Mad Dog 2020, so I went down and got some, and apparently I went completely nuts in the lobby at about 3 o'clock in the morning, butt naked. California, that's no big deal, but... Uh, <laughs> They thought I was crazy, and the police took, they just took me to county mental health, and I, they gave me that wonderful drug, Thorazine, and settled me right down, and, uh, and I came too. And, um, I have no idea where my daughter is. I haven't got a clue. But you see, I can't say nothing about my daughter. Cause I don't deal with the police on any level for any reason. And I know that, you know, as soon as I get my clothes back, it's going to come to me wherever she's at, and I'm going to go find her, and we're going to get out of Florida. And I'm telling this doctor, I'm saying, hey, man, you know, I've been through a lot of trauma. This is a, I give you my word, this is a mistake me even being here. If you let me out of here, I'm on the next plane. I'm going back to California. I'm getting out of Florida immediately. And he says, be gone. And I left, and I got my clothes, and I got outside of that hospital, and I'm walking down the steps, and here comes my daughter with this young couple. My daughter ran up and jumped in my arms, and I said, come on, baby, we're getting out of Florida. I told you this place sucks. You know, and, uh, and I'd love to tell you that uh, our life got really good after that. Well, I'm going to tell you that that's as good as it ever got. In the next couple of years, we lived wherever we could. We lived in bus stations. We lived in an abandoned bus one time. We lived in missions. And I lived in five different states over the next couple of years, and we just kept moving. And every place we moved, we left at midnight on a dead run. I met this young man on a bus going to Oklahoma. I was leaving Georgia, as a matter of fact, but I'm not going to say nothing about that. (laughs) And I met this young man, and he was a good Christian man. And I told him, I was talking to him, he was just one of the kindest, nicest men I've ever met in my life. And he said, you know, my father's got a business, and at our place, we got a little house that you and your daughter could live in. We'd love you to come in here, and you could come to church with us, and we'll help you rebuild your life. And those were the nicest people I've ever met in my life. They brought us into their home, this complete stranger, and they gave me a job. And I went to work, and they said, you can't drink, it's the only deal. And I said, okay. And I meant it. I meant it. There was an opportunity. And I worked for those people for one week. I also, I didn't sleep that week. I had a million voices going on in my head that week, and I was real sick that week. And they paid us on Friday, and the guy... I worked with, he says, come on, I'm going to go into town to cash my check. You want to come with me? I'll buy you a beer. And I said, God bless you. And uh, we went into town and we cashed that check. And, and I came back in. It was real late that night. And I walked in and my little girl looked up at me. I hope I never forget that look. She just looked at me and she grabbed a raggedy old doll and a pillow and went and stood by the door. I changed my clothes, and I said, come on, baby. And we got down to the bus station one more time, and I bought us a ticket to California. And I bought me a big bottle of wine, and we got on that bus, and I passed out. And we come to in Gallup, New Mexico. And I come to, and I opened my eyes, my little girl was sitting there, and she was rocking back and forth, and she was telling me how hungry she was. 
I said, what's the matter? I said, Daddy, you haven't fed me. I'm so hungry. I said, baby, as soon as we stop, I'm going to get you something to eat. Just hang on. And we pulled into this little place in Albuquerque, New Mexico. And I got off that bus, and I went and bought her a little sandwich at this liquor store, and I bought me a bottle of wine, and I got up to go pay for it. And I only had enough money for one or the other. And I had to put her sandwich back. I've done things that you will never hear from the podium. But I've just shared with you the most humiliating, the most shameful thing I've ever done in my life. And it gives me no pleasure. But that's what alcohol does. Thank God that I've always had angels looking out for me because there was this wonderful, wonderful black lady that was sitting right across from us and she never made no judgment. She looked over at my little girl and she said, Honey, she says, my daughter just made me this big lunch and I can't eat all this. Why don't you come over here and sit with me? And that wonderful woman, God bless her, wherever she is, she took care of my little girl all the way back to California. We got back to California and I did what all heroes do at the end of the road. I went to Mom's house. I told you about my mom. She opened the door. My, my, my daughter, Janet, is the only granddaughter she had. And she thought the sun rose and set on her. And she hadn't known if we were dead or alive for over two years. She saw my little girl with a raggedy dress on. And she'd been crying. She's holding on to that raggedy old doll. And she grabbed it by the arm and she pulled her in the house. And she said, you get off my property or I'll kill you. You don't ever come back. And I said, yes, ma'am. And I, and I left. Now, the next three years, I don't know nothing about it. Most of it's hearsay. I know that I lived in a, in a bamboo patch right on the Pacific Ocean, right next to a 7-Eleven that I panhandled for wine. And I drank wine until I passed out or until I would go into a convulsion or some type of seizure in public and they would take me to the hospital or I'd go completely berserk at an intersection and they'd take me to the nut house. Or someone would beat me up real bad and they would have to take me to the hospital. But in anything, anything between that, I was drinking wine. And I was an animal. And I was standing in front of the 7-Eleven one morning, and I was sicker than a dog, and I was shaking so bad I couldn't panhandle anymore. And I was standing there shaking, and this car pulled up, and this man got out, and he, and he got up, and he just looked at me, and he smiled, and he gave me two $1 bills. And I ran in that store, and I got me a quart of wine, and I got outside, and I pulled that cap and took a big pull off that jug and just leaned against that grass until the shaking stopped. And I opened my eyes and I looked in the window and I saw this man and his wife and his kids sitting in their car and they were talking and I knew they were talking about me and judging me and I turned around and flipped them off and cursed them and wandered back to my bush. And I'm here to tell you, those people weren't judging me at all. They were very good friends of mine. In fact, as I wandered off, they, those people were on the way to their, their church to worship the God of their understanding that morning. And that whole family got out of that car that morning and they got on their knees and they prayed for that poor human being they saw walking off. And I woke out in my bamboo patch and I pulled a plug and I took a big pull and I had the weirdest thought come out of nowhere I've ever had in my life. He said, maybe you ought to go to A&A. And &A. I went, whoa! <laughs> I've been to A&A. &A. Them H and I people that carry the message into people that are confined in hospitals and institutions, they'd come and talk to me a hundred times, you know, and they'd be telling me how wonderful it is to be sober and that if I come to Alcoholics Anonymous, they would love me till I could love myself. And I was very patient with them. I tell them I'm not an alcoholic, you know, I'm actually a drug addict. I just can't afford any alcohol right now, any drugs right now. And they would laugh and they'd say, well, if you find yourself drinking and you don't want to be drinking, come on here, we can help you with that. And the next thing I know, I, I, you know, it was, it, it was really weird, man. My next conscious thought was, I'm standing in this doorway and I'm looking at all these people that are sitting down and they're looking at me. And they asked me to identify myself. I drink port wine all day, all night. 
If I'm awake, I'm drinking. And I've been doing that for a number of years. And it had done something really strange to my brain. I, I would have these absolute epiphanies. But between my mouth and my brain, it would get stuck. And what would come out was, ah! It's great for panhandling, you know? People just throw money at you and back off, you know? And that's what I did. I went, ah! And I said, thank you, sit down. And I'm waiting for this big onslaught of love, you know? I sat next to this pretty little gal, man, she scooted all the way down. You know? I started looking around, and my first impression that I think I'm at a PTA meeting, these people looked a lot like you folks, you know? And I got hair that comes down to here, and my, my beard comes down to my belly, and I, I weigh about 120 pounds. I've been living in the same clothes for three years. A bunch of things live on me besides me. And uh, I have a very distinct aroma, I was told. And uh, I knew I was different. But I noticed right away they started talking, and they were talking about God. And I went, oh, no. And then I saw them pass a basket. I knew they were going to start singing any minute. <laughs> and I said, i got to get out of here, man. <clears throat> They'll have me selling flowers somewhere, you know. And uh, I, I stood up to leave, and there was this old gal who had been looking at me from the minute I walked in that place, man. And she'd been looking at me and smiling and trying to catch my eye. I thought she was one of them brain-damaged gals I'd heard about. You know, and I got up to leave, and she shot to her feet. There was a man talking. She cut him completely off. She looked right at me, and she pointed at me. She said, son, she goes, I walked in these rooms 27 years ago. Long Beach, California. A cop brought me in, told me to go in there. He was tired of arresting me. And I walked in this room with all these squares. I thought I was at a PTA meeting. I went, whoa. <laughs> she goes, I turned around to leave because when I saw you people, I knew that you would turn me away when you saw what I was. She goes, I've been on the streets of Los Angeles for, since I was 13 years old, and I've done everything a woman ever had to do to survive out there. And when I saw you people, I felt dirty, and I was ashamed, and I wanted to leave. But a woman grabbed me by the hand and brought me into the room and put her arm around me, and she said, don't go nowhere, honey, we need you. Proceeded to tell me about 27 years of continuous sobriety of service in Alcoholics Anonymous, about the women who grabbed a hold of her and taught her how to be a woman, about a sponsor who took her through the 12 steps and got her actively involved in service, about 27 years of continuous sobriety and a life of sobriety. She came over in front of all those people, man, that really didn't know what to do with me, and she put her arms around me, and she kissed me right on the mouth of the bravest woman I've ever met in my life. <laughs> And she hugged onto me real tight, and she's squeezing me, and she's whispering in my ear. She's going, don't go nowhere, baby. She goes, we need you desperately. And she said those words to me, and something happened. People have been beating on me, stabbing me, beating me with clubs, and everything else since as long as I can remember. But there ain't nobody in this world that has ever made me cry. And this old gal, she's loving on me, and she's telling me that we need you. And my ear, my eyes started getting wet, and this rumbling started going on in my gut. And pretty soon I'm standing there with this old gal just crying like a baby in front of all these squares. And I started coming to A&A. And you all lied to me. You told me that I, if I quit drinking alcohol, my life would get better. You know what you get when you take alcohol away from a real alcoholic? All that's left is ick. That's what it feels like. Ick. Why would you ever want to feel like this? Everything's so real, you know? You start remembering what you've done. How do you ever go to sleep? How do you stop the voices? How do you stop the screaming? And I go to these meetings, man, and these people tell me, you got to get a sponsor. I said, I've been on parole most of my life. I'm not volunteering.
you know? They say, you got to do these steps. I'm looking at those steps, you know? Powerless? I have never been powerless. I've been carrying a gun since I was 14 years old. You know, I'm not powerless. He said, my life's unmanageable. I like it that way. I love chaos, man. I hate knowing what's going to happen next. I looked at these other steps, man, and, and, I, and I, the one of them really caught my eye. And that was this fourth one. And I asked this guy, I said, what's this all about? He said, well, you've got to write down everything you've ever done and then admit it to another human being. I fell out of my chair laughing. I prided myself of being a career criminal in that day and age, and I'd spent a lifetime trying not to establish a paper trail, and now you want me to write it all down and share it with the PTA. <laughs> I can't do that. Saw this next one, man, that really caught my eye. This, I said, what exactly does amends mean? And he says, that's when you got to go face everybody you've ever harmed and make it right. I'm going, oh, yeah, yeah. Hey, Loopy, it's Kip. Hey, bro, I'm sorry I shot you and your brother and your dog and took all your dope. But I'm in a spiritual manner of living today, and I'm here to make things right. I don't think so. I don't think Loopy would have understood that. But I wanted what y'all had so bad, man. I came to meetings, and I came to meetings, and I came to meetings. And as long as I was still living in the bushes, I came to meetings. Because, see, we didn't have any treatment centers where I live. There was nothing unless you had insurance that would pay your way $25,000, 30000 That's the only way you got any recovery back then. There wasn't nothing like Mar. And I kept living in those bushes, and I kept coming to meetings, and I'd go to meetings, and I'd stay sober as long as I possibly could, sometimes two and three days in a row. And then I'd finally, I'd sit with you people, I'd go to coffee with you, I'd talk with you, I'd hang with you, but you'd have to go back to your lives, and you'd leave, and you'd leave me alone, and it would just be me. And there's a word that alcoholics know better than any segment of society. And I don't care where you come from or where you've been. When I say this word, you know exactly what I'm talking about because you know what it tastes like. You know what it smells like and you know what it feels like. And that word is loneliness. Alcoholics know what that word means more than anyone in this world. Where loneliness is such, if it was a tangible thing, it would have absolutely eaten me alive. If it wasn't for alcohol, I would have had to blow my brains off. I'd have to drink. And I came to meetings and I did this for six years. For six years of coming and going and I couldn't get sober in Alcoholics Anonymous. I couldn't do the things that were asked of me to do here. I come to Christmas morning the same way I've come to a thousand times in my life. Butt naked, completely hog-tied in the patty, in this rubber room where the cops had beat me down so bad that night before on Christmas Eve that my face was, my cheekbone was crushed and I'd been bleeding. My face was stuck to this mat and I'm trying to pull my face off this mat. And I roll over and I look at these cops looking down at the, the porthole at me and I just know Santa Claus ain't coming. You know? And the cops let me go one more time. You know, I'd gotten in an argument with a cop and I always lost because they cheat. You know, call their friends and use their sticks. They got radios. Need some backup here. I never needed no backup. <sighs> they beat me down. They said, "We'll see you later, Kip. Merry Christmas." And I left. And I made a I made a solemn oath right there and there. I've never gone back to A and A again. A don't work for me. I'm that person they talk about in chapter 5. I'm incapable of being honest with myself, and it's not my fault. I can't. I can't live without alcohol. That's the only thing in the wire, this world that doesn't lie to me. It's the only thing that takes away the pain, that takes away the loneliness, that takes away the terror. It's the only thing in this world that works. And I got, I, when I got out of jail, I don't know where it came from, but I had $90 in cash. And I went to the liquor store and I bought $90 worth of Gallo port wine. It's one of the most beautiful sights you've ever seen in your life. It kind of makes my hair stand up right now thinking about it, you know. 
it took me two trips to get this stash back to my little hooch, you know. And then I got in this hooch and I started drinking. I locked the door and I just said, La Porta, the doorway. I don't care what happens. Take away the pain. And I started drinking. On January 6th, it was the most painful day of my life. January 6th, alcohol stopped working. There's a part in the big book of Alcoholics Anonymous that describes that very clearly. It says there'll come a time when you cannot imagine life with alcohol or without it. It says you'll know loneliness such as few people can even imagine. And you'll come to the jumping off spot and you'll wish for the end. And when I realized that alcohol wasn't going to work no more, it wouldn't take away the pain, it didn't let me get any rest, it didn't stop the screaming, I couldn't get drunk, I couldn't get sober. I pulled out my gun and I put it to my heart and I pulled the trigger. And I blew my left lung and two ribs out and knocked me all the way across the room. And I'm sliding down this wall with blood flying everywhere. And the only thought I got is, thank God this is over with. Let me out of here. Just let me go. And I come through in this hospital. You thought I died, didn't you? Huh? <laughs> I ain't no quitter. <laughs> There was this old man, Alcoholics Anonymous. I hated his guts, you know. He was one of those old timers. He says, I'm a grateful alcoholic, you know. You just want to throw up on his wingtips every time he said it. <laughs> and he came up to me meeting one of those times when I was running in and out of there, and he got up to me dead in my face. He looked me right in the eye, and he said, You think you're pretty tough, don't you, kid? I looked him right in the eye. I gave him my best jailhouse look. He said, I'm tough enough, old man. Don't you ever doubt that. He looked at me. He got this big grin. He got right dead in my face. He says, you ain't tough. He says, you're the scaredest son of a bitch in this room. And that might make you dangerous, but it don't make you tough. And he walked away laughing at me. I avoided that man like the plague. Sometime I'd go to a meeting, I'd circle that room, looking in all the windows to make sure he wasn't in there, you know. But I've been in this coma for about a week, and I'm coming out of this coma, and I hear this voice off in the distance, man. And it's this deep, gravelly voice that God only gave to one human being, and it was Charlie Tuck. And I opened my eyes, and there's Charlie Tuck standing at the foot of my bed with these two newcomers, and their eyes were as big as saucers. He's holding that big blue book. And I knew I had died, I'd gone to hell, and this was it. Four point restraints on a gurney with preaching AA for eternity <laughs> without a drink. But I wasn't dead. And Charlie looked at me and he had a sad look in his face. And he just looked at me and I put his arms around these two young men and he said, You see this pitiful man laying here? And they go, Yeah. And they go, Well, Pay attention. But this is what happens to alcoholics who don't take the steps. Come on, let's go. Didn't say a word to me. They didn't know how sensitive I was, you know. I'm really proud to tell you folks that those two young men are still sober today. And every year, Friday, Thursday night meeting in Carlsbad, California, they thank me from the podium. I was doing active 12-step work a long time before I got sober. And, um, <laughs> you know, I, I, I was in that hospital for three months, and I got out, and I just kept doing what I was doing. It didn't work. I just wanted to die. I just prayed every single day, please, God, just let me die. Just let me go. Let me out of here. And I come to on May 12, 1984. I need a drink and it don't work and I know it don't work and I'm thinking maybe it'll work today. Maybe it'll take away the pain. Maybe it'll stop the loneliness. And then all of a sudden I hear this. I came from nowhere, man. I've been to so many of these A and A meetings. These people had poisoned my mind, you know, because all I can hear is the ABCs. It's read at the end of chapter five out of the big book of Alcoholics Anonymous. And that states that A says that I'm an alcoholic. Now I got paperwork from the state of California saying I'm an alcoholic. I got no problem with this denial stuff I hear people talking about. I know I'm an alcoholic, so what? But you know what? I don't mean that. What it talks about in that is just in my innermost self here where I live. 
Not what I admit to my counselor or my judge or my parole officer or anything else. In here where I live, what does that word really mean? I started thinking. And I remembered that morning on that bus with my daughter. And I felt the love that I, when I held her in her arms, when she was born. And I know that I'd give my life for her without a hesitation, without a thought. But it suddenly dawned on me what alcohol does to Kip Collins. You see, when Kip takes a drink of alcohol, when it starts an allergic reaction, it starts a chain reaction. And the only thing it does, it tells me, it says, I want some more. And when I drink it, take one drink of alcohol, it starts a thing going in me, and it's like pour fire on a gasoline, trying to, gasoline on a fire, trying to put it out. And you know, there's no room for any human being in my life, unless you're buying. It doesn't matter about who I love, what I love, my morals, my dreams, my plans, and it sure as hell doesn't matter about yours. I gotta do what alcohol tells me to do because it owns me body and soul. And it tells me when I gotta go to bed. It tells me when I gotta get up. It tells me how far I can go. It tells me who I can hang with. It takes away everything. But I don't have to feel. Got to the next part that said that, that no human power was ever gonna fix me. I kept hoping one of you pretty gals in AA was gonna fix me. And if you're here tonight, you should have listened to your sponsor. And that scared me. I kept hoping someone in AA was gonna say something, you know. Some counselor was gonna say something to me. Some preacher was gonna do the right thing to me. But I got to the next part and said that God could and would if he were sought. Now this God thing, I've been avoiding this from the gate. If there was a God, he certainly had a perverse sense of humor. God don't like people like me. He likes people who live in the suburbs. He's been pissed off at me since I got here and I didn't know why. He's the one that put me in that insane asylum that I grew up in. He's the one that put me in that Mexican prison. He's the one that made me go through all the degrading and everything that I ever had to do to live out there on those streets. He's the one that wiped out my son. He's the one that killed my brother. I don't want nothing to do with this God you people talk about. He never cut me no slack. I cried out to him millions of times. He never cut me no slack. He had nothing coming from me and I got nothing coming from him and that was fine. But I started thinking about the people who had what I wanted. And I'm not talking about their money, their women, or their stuff. I'm talking about a look in their eye and the way where they walk through this world one day at a time with a little bit of dignity. And a little sparkle that I didn't see in everyone else's eye. And all these people had one thing in common. They talked about this power that did for them what they couldn't do for themselves. And I got down on my knees that morning. And I said this prayer that hasn't changed much for them. I said, you know, I don't know who you are, and I don't know what you are, and I sure hope it don't make no difference. But from this day forward, I will do anything that you put in front of me if I don't have to drink. And if you're not there, I'm screwed. And I don't have the vocabulary to tell you what happened to me. But I can tell you this from my heart to yours that that moment was the only moment of peace I'd ever known in my life. And I knew that if I could hold on to that surrender, that I wasn't going to have to drink. And I beat it over to Charlie Tuck's house. But where else am I going to go, you know? And I knocked on his door, and his lovely wife, member of Al-Anon for over 43 years, God bless her, she opened the door, and we called her St. Edie, you know, and she opened the door, and she goes, Ah, Jeff. Charlie is going to be so excited. And she goes, you know, you're his favorite. <laughs> and I, oh. I found out later she told that to everybody, but you know. <laughs> no one had ever needed to hear that more than I did right then. She said, come on around here to the porch, honey. Charlie will be out in a minute. And I went back there and she brought me a big glass of orange juice and Cairo syrup. She goes, this will help. And I sat there, and Charlie came out, and he had that big old blue book with him. 
And he looked at me, and he got a big grin, and he said, how you doing, son? And I said, I'm doing fine, Charlie. He said, what can I do for you? He said, I said, I don't want to drink no more. He goes, yeah, you've been saying that for a while. So what's new? I said, I don't know. He goes, what are you willing to do? I said, anything you tell me. He says, let me ask you a real important question. He says, Kip, are you done? And I looked at him at the most sincere moment of my life, and I said, Charlie, you know, I don't know nothing about God, but I know you do. And I pray to your God that I'm done. He said, my God, that's a pretty good answer, son. <laughs> and he sat down beside me. He says, Kip, he says, I got some good news and I got some bad news for you. The bad news is people like you don't get sober. Something inside of you is badly broken. It's very obvious. But it's also very obvious to me that God has opened a window for you that I can see that sparkle in your eye. And I suggest you step through with both feet. And this is the way it's going to have to be for you one day at a time, every day of your life. One simple little fact. Nothing. Absolutely nothing. No woman, no job, no child, no nothing can ever become more important than you doing what you have to do to maintain your sobriety. And that is a lot, lot, lot more than just going to meetings. Do you understand that? And I said, no, but I'm sure you're going to explain it. You know? And it was on Mother's Day, and he lived right next to the county city park, and we walked across the street, and I didn't know what he's doing. We got in front of this big crowd of people. He says, get on your knees, and he dropped to his. And I looked around at all these people, and they're looking at us. I said, well, all these people. He said, Kip, these people have been stepping over you for years. He said, don't you ever be ashamed of your God, son, because that's the only hope you got. And I got down on my knees that morning. And he taught me how to pray. And he took me back to his little house. He had a little room in the back of his house that he detoxed guys like me. And he sat back there and he told me his story. And the guys he sponsored come, took turns coming over and sitting with me. And they told me their stories and they held me and I cried and I wanted a drink and I needed a drink and my body was craving for alcohol and they held me. And I didn't drink. And after five days, I was starting to feel human a little bit. And he says, the magic words. I've always wondered why Alcoholics Anonymous didn't nick a bumper sticker. Some of the most important words a newcomer ever hears. He says, so what do we do? He says, get in the car. Get in the car. That's where it begins. <laughs> Charlie was blind. He lost his right eye in a fight. And he had a glass eye. Charlie was actively involved in service. He had this big old Cadillac. And we get in this Cadillac, and Charlie, if you were new, you had to sit up front with him, and he had to talk to you constantly. And when he talked to you, he had to look at you. <laughs> and we'd get on Interstate 5, and he'd put those front wheels on those little bumps. And we would drive by Braille all the way to San Diego. <laughs> And by the time you got to San Diego, you knew he had a relationship with God. <laughs> you know? And he took, took me into this detox. And he said, I want you to go in there and tell these people how you're doing it. I said, what are you talking about? I've been sober five days. I said, these people haven't had a drink in one day. Go tell them how it feels to be five days. And I did. And I walked in. He says, I felt pretty good, didn't I? I said, yeah. And I started discovering the magic of Alcoholics Anonymous. And that old man laid out a program of action for me. And it started out with one word. One of the most important words. And I watched this word get watered down in Alcoholics Anonymous. And I don't like it. It's the one word that has saved my life and changed every aspect of my life. And that word is called commitment. He goes, the word commitment as a member of Alcoholics Anonymous. It means something that it doesn't mean to other, those other people out here. Because, see, they won't die. You'll die. When you give your word as a member of Alcoholics Anonymous that you're going to do something, there's only one excuse for not doing it. You died on the way there. Period. She says, you ran out of excuses the day before you got here. So don't ever give me one. He said, this is the way it's going to be for you. You're going to be involved at a men's meeting at all times. You're going to be at a step study and a book study. 
You're going to be at a meeting of Alcoholics Anonymous every single night. You'll get there an hour early. You'll shake hands with every person that walks in that room. You will not hug the women. You'll shake their hand. You will not borrow any money from anyone. You will not borrow any cigarettes from anyone. You will not tell anyone anything about you unless they ask. And I'm going, okay. He said at the end of the meeting, you will beg the secretary to let you help tear it down and help be a part of this. And that's how you get involved. Stop taking and start giving. I'm coming up on 90 days. I'm in a meeting every single night. I said, I almost got 90 days. He says, so what? I go, you know, 90 and 90. He goes, that don't apply to you. You know? And, and I was at a meeting of Alcoholics Anonymous, and I had a commitment in Alcoholics Anonymous every single night of the week for the next three years. And that's what I started on. That old man took me through those 12 steps thoroughly out of the big book of Alcoholics Anonymous. He got me actively involved in service. He made me do things that didn't make any sense. First thing he did, he made me get an identification in my real name. What? An order? That was a little bizarre. You know, but I went and I did it. I got an identification in my real name. He said, now you're going to get a job. I said, no, I want to work on my recovery. He said, sober people work. Get a job. And then he, I got paid, and he said, did you pay your bills? I said, well, I haven't got enough. He goes, what? I said, if I give, I, it'll take all my money. He goes, they don't want any of your money. I go, yeah, they want all of it. No, they just want theirs. Oh. Okay. And I started paying bills on a regular basis, you know. And things in my life started happening. I got into a trade. A guy gave me a break, and, a, and it was in painting. And the guy, he gave me a break in there, and, and my sponsor made me make a commitment that I would work for this man for a minimum of two years, that I'd never ask him what he was paying me. Whatever he paid me was more than I was worth. That I would be the first man there, the last one to leave. I'd do anything he asked me to do as long as it was moral and legal. And he said, you won't quit. You'll never give him a reason to quit, that to fire you. And I said, okay. And I, and I went to work for this man, and I worked for two years, and I worked my way up in that company. And, and, and by three years, I'd met her in Alcoholics Anonymous, a wonderful woman. She got sober on the same day I did. She liked to fish. God's will, you know. <laughs> we got married. My sponsor was not happy with that idea, but we did. And what does he know? You know, and uh, <clears throat> I'll tell you, in all seriousness, that was one of the the better marriages I've known in Alcoholics Anonymous because my wife was totally committed to Alcoholics Anonymous and so was I. And things in our life started happening, man. I got my contractor's license at three years. And at three years, which is a 45-minute story in itself, the state of California gave me my driver's license back, which is impossible, but it happened. And at three years sober, I came home one day and the phone rang and it was this girl. She says, is your name Kip? I said, yeah. She goes, do you know Sandy so-and-so? And I said, well, a long time ago. She goes, that's my mother and you're my daddy, and I've been looking for you for a long time. And that little girl that was born so long ago when I was locked up, man, she came into my life, and she bought me three grand, beautiful grandchildren. And I had a wonderful home to show her. And I was sober. And I got to go talk to her mother and her family and make amends and make things right with that family. And they came in and joined my family. Three years sober, I got custody of my daughter and my son. I went back to my first wife. We'd owned a lot of property together, and I signed everything off to her for custody of my children. And I got my baby. I got my little boy, and I got that little girl. And the men in Alcoholics Anonymous, I had this handicapped child, and I didn't know what to do. And the men, I met some men who had handicapped children, and they started telling me what to do. And I got involved in a special school up in Riverside, California, for kids just like him. And that little girl that I drug around, she started going to school. And one day a man came. He said, sir, I'd like to talk to you. And I said, what? And he said, my name is Sean Anderson, and I'll... I would like to ask for your daughter's hand in marriage. She says, I have to have your blessing or she can't marry me. I traded that right for a bottle of wine. Alcoholics Anonymous gave me that back. I asked the man, I said, do you drink? He said, no, sir. I said, do you work? He goes, yes, sir. I said, okay, here's the way it is. If you ever raise your hand in anger at my daughter, never sleep in the same place twice, you understand? 
He goes, yes, sir. And, and I gave them a wedding that I dreamed of the day they she was born in exactly the same place. And I wore the suit. She wore the dress. And I walked her down the aisle. And she looked at me and said, thank you, Daddy, the way I dreamed. And Alcoholics Anonymous is what gave that back to me. I threw that away. That little boy, they told me to pray that he dies. I got him involved in that school. And we got involved in Special Olympics. And at the age of 23 years old, that little boy graduated from high school for handicapped children. And he walked down with a black robe and that hat and came down and handed me his diploma and he told me he loved me. <laughs> and my world was full, you know. At 10 years sober, I'd made an awful lot of money legally. And... Uh, <laughs> And I had always had a dream. I'd wanted to go to Australia. And I, I went to Australia, and I, I stayed there for two months and traveled around and just going to meetings of AA all around the whole country. Had a marvelous time. And I got back, and I'm looking at my life. I've got a beautiful home. i got the boat. i got the trucks. i got the woman. i got my kids. I mean, I'm sponsoring half of San Diego. I'm speaking everywhere. i got money in the bank. You know, i got a driver's license. i got insurance. I got My dog's even got a license, you know. <laughs> I mean, i got it together. And, and I'm thinking... How do you get from there to here? How can you possibly get from where I came from to here? And I opened up the newspaper and I started reading on the headlines. There was a story about a woman. A man had broke into her house and raped her in front of her children all night long. And when he was done with her, he took a knife and cut her to pieces. And it was my daughter. And I went to the hospital. And my daughter, she did not die. She lost all the bit of blood she had in her body, and the paramedics saved her life. She had zero blood pressure when they got there. And she lost her face, and she lost her breast, and she lost her right arm. I'm telling you all straight up with no apologies that I am absolutely first capable of first-degree murder if you hurt one of my children. This man's in jail. You see, that ain't no problem for someone like me. I can reach you anywhere. And I, I, I can't talk. I can't sleep. My heart is so full. It is so full of hate and rage. And I want justice. And I'm reading that book. And I can't sleep. And I'm nuts. And my sponsor told me that nothing could be more important. Nothing. No woman. No job. No child. The answers for me living in this world one day at a time. All the solutions were in the big book. And I got that book out. And I started reading. And I wasn't looking for no solution. I was looking for... a an angle. And all it says in there is that people like me, an alcoholic, cannot afford the dubious luxury that normal people can with anger and resentment. Because in doing so, it'll cut me off from the sunlight of God's spirit. And the insanity will return and I'll drink. And for me to drink is to die. It says in that book, if I've got a resentment I can't get rid of, I've got to get down on my knees and pray for that animal. To have everything out of life that I want. And the hardest thing I've ever done since I landed on your planet was to get on my knees and pray for that animal. And the insanity went away. And I was able to go talk to the men in my group. And I was able to still cry. And I cried my eyes out. And I was able to go take care of my daughter and my grandchildren. I had the financial means to do so. When well, my daughter needed me the most in her life, Alcoholics Anonymous gave her a sober daddy that acted like a responsible human being, and I did what I was supposed to do as a father and a grandfather. And I didn't have to hurt nobody. I left that with the law. You know, he just got out of jail. He lives a mile and a half from me. And every morning in my prayers, I say, God, please, not today. But I know God, way he works in my life, I'll, he'll probably ask me to sponsor him next week, you know. <laughs> you know, and I got through that, you know, and, and, and it, it, I came down, I had, I had a big growth, and, and I had to go to a doctor, and, and they told me that I have cancer, and they're going to have to remove my lower lip, and I like my lip right where it's at. I'm talking to this doctor, they said, well, you know, we're going to have I, my sponsor said, go see another doctor, and I went and saw six different doctors, and I finally found this great plastic surgeon. And he said, well, we're going to do this surgery. And he says, are you allergic to any type of narcotics? And I said, 
All of them. He goes, what do you mean? I said, anything that affects me from the neck up. He goes, well, this is very painful. You couldn't possibly go through this. I said, let me tell you something, boss. I said, have you ever seen an active heroin addict? He goes, well, yeah, in the hospital. I said, not in the hospital, in your living room. But I'm telling you right now, you put any dope in me, I'm moving in with you. I'm going to call you daddy. And I explained to him, I said, I'm a drug addict and I'm an alcoholic and I'm going through a lot of emotional pain right now. And if you put anything in my body to block that emotional pain, I'll never be able to stop. And I would rather die of this cancer than to lose one day of my sobriety. And he said, okay, we need, we did that with Novocaine and uh, aspirin. I did not walk through that with any type of dignity whatsoever. I sniveled and cried like a little schoolgirl, man, for days. But the men of Alcoholics Anonymous, they came and sat with me. And they always do when I have a need. And they sat with me around the clock and they would try to make me laugh because they cut my lip from here to here down to here and put it back together. And... It was all sewed together, and they would try to make me laugh because it would start bleeding. These guys are really sick. Oh. <laughs> but that's the kind of guys I hang with, you know. And uh, But they loved me, man, and they took care of me. And, uh, and I got through it. I didn't have to put anything in my body. And I got through that. I found out that I can go through anything. You know, and this woman that I'd been married to, Connie, I love this woman. It was the very first woman that I ever experienced true intimacy with. I'm not talking about sex. I'm talking about taking off all your armor in broad daylight and letting a woman look at you. And she didn't back up. And I love this woman, the first woman I had ever truly loved, unconditionally. And I was madly in love with her. And, you know... I, I'd been busy with my daughter and with this surgery and there had been something going on with Connie and, and I came home one day and she was sitting on the couch and she was crying I said, what's the matter? She goes, i got to talk to you, Kip. She goes, I don't want to hurt you. I said, then don't. You know? Don't fight the feeling. <laughs> I knew it was serious. She said, she goes, Kip, she goes, I can't do this anymore. I said, do what? She goes, I can't live this life. I said, what are you talking about, Connie? She goes, I'm a lesbian, and I'm in love with Chrissy, and I can't do this deal with a man anymore. i got to leave. And I didn't think she was going to tell me that, you know? I thought I forgot to take the trash out or something. And I reacted the way I always react when I don't know what to do. I started screaming and cussing her, you know? And I went to see my my priest, but I'm, I'm Catholic now, and, uh, and Father Bill had been sober for 28 years, and I went and told him this story. I'm not uh, looking for help. I was ratting her out to the church, you know, and, uh, <laughs> he looked at me, and I said, so what do you think, Father? He says, I think you make me sick. I go, what? He goes, you know, you're, you're always talking about that big book. Have you ever read it? I'm going, yeah. He says, you ever read page 62? You know, the guy that thought he could rest satisfaction out of life if he only did everything just right? I go, well, how does that apply to me? He says, well, you keep telling me all this that you did for her, and now she has done this. On the bottom of the next page, it says the very first requirement to do this is you've got to quit playing God. Who the hell made you in charge of her sexuality? She's not your property. The way I see it, she was honest with you, and she faced you, and that was painful for her. It jeopardized her sobriety. She could have easily just ran. She thought enough of you to face you. You go give her a divorce and give her anything you want. She was a good wife to you. And I did. And you know what? I didn't have to drink. And neither did she. And I got through it, you know. It was just my daughter was married. She was gone. My wife was gone. It was just me and my son and my dog. And, and I was starting to work. I was starting to get my life together. And I went to this job and this big Rottweiler attacked me and almost tore my right arm off. And, and I'm bleeding to death in this hospital and in this ambulance. And I called my buddy Scotty. I said, Scotty, I'm bleeding to death. Get me to the hospital. Don't let him put any dope in me. And he's an outlaw motorcyclist and about 20 bikes. But met the ambulance at the hospital. And they're running in, following the gurney, saying, Don't give this man any narcotics. <laughs> and they stayed with me. And they looked and saw everything that they were putting in my body. Because these guys knew. They knew. And they wouldn't let them put anything in my body that would affect my sobriety.
And I'm not telling you this, and I'm not telling anything what to do with your medication. You do anything you want to do. My wife will not leave me if you get loaded, you know. I'm not real smart. I burned up most of my brain cells with cheap wine. But the one thing I know, without a shadow of a doubt, that's written in granite, that no matter what i got to do to stay sober, it's easier to stay sober than to get sober again. You know, and I ended up, I couldn't work. I lost everything, all the material stuff I'd worked for, and it was just me and my son, and my son got sick. And I had to take him to the hospital, and I sat with him. And on October 4th of 1993, he died in my arms. And it was then, it was then that I got to understand in the promises. It talks says that we will know serenity. I got to find out exactly what serenity is. What it means to me. And what it means to me, it has nothing to do with a pocket full of money watching a beautiful sunset with her. The serenity I know is watching a thing that I love more than my own life die in my arms and hurting more than I knew it was humanly possible to her. But at the same time, in my heart of hearts, knowing that this is God's business and he doesn't make mistakes and it's not personal. And I found out that I could have a heart that was completely serene and still cry. And it was okay. And I got down on my knees that morning at that front of his bed. I had to turn off the life support machine and I shaved my son and got him ready for the coroner. And I thank the God of my understanding for the men in Alcoholics Anonymous who had taught me how to be a father. Because I got to be the kind of father I dreamed about being through Alcoholics Anonymous right up to the day. And my son loved me with all of his heart. And he had forgiven me. You guys gave that to me. You know, I wanted after that, it was just me, man. I was nothing. All the stuff was gone. The people were gone. It was just me. And I want to jam a woman in my life quick, you know. And I'm telling my sponsor, I said, you know what? I am, I need a relationship. And he goes, he looked at me and he says, I'm going to give you some of the best advice I've ever given you. Listen closely. It is absolutely impossible for an alcoholic to have a relationship if they need one. That is not a relationship. You are looking for another human being to fill that emptiness that only God can fill. And until you're a whole man once again, you got nothing to offer any woman. All you can do is hurt someone and yourself. So you leave women alone. And I said, can I date? He says, yeah, but keep it light. You know? And I started going to school, you know, and, and I was really focused on going to school. I'd wanted to get this degree, and I'd only been to the seventh grade, and I went in this pursuit, and, and I did real well. And I stayed away from women, you know, and I had one little slip. <laughs> it wasn't my fault. As always, I was a victim of a woman, you know. I had this one little torrid affair, and... uh she left, and it was gone. It was over with, and I went to school. And one day I was sitting in my house. I was working on some homework and watching a ball game, and there was this gal on UNA. She called up and said, Hey, Kip. She goes, You've been alone for a long time. I said, Yeah, a couple of years. She goes, Well, why don't you come up, come on over for dinner, and maybe we could mess around. I went, Whoa. I said, Well, I'm very flattered, but, uh, you know, I'm kind of busy. I'm watching a game with the dog, and... <clears throat> Maybe I could take a rain check. She hung up on me, you know. And that was okay. And I, and I went, wow, that was okay. You know what? H- how did that happen? And when I said, I, I'm a whole human being. I love women. You guys are the greatest thing since banana peels, but I don't need you. You know, I was comfortable in my whole skin. I was a whole human being. And I said, God, this is what you're talking about. Thank you, man. I'm full. I'm whole. And he, he says, but... I would love to experience true love one more time, if it be thy will. you got to learn how to talk to God. (laughs) 
But if not, that's cool. I'm overpaid already, you know, and I just went about my day. You know, I was supposed to speak down in San Diego. I was got up that morning and the phone rang and it was this gal's mother I'd had this little affair with. She says, hi. I said, how you doing? She goes, well, I got some bad news. Carmen got drunk last night, got in a real bad car wreck. She's got massive brain damage. She's broke her legs in about 20 different places. She'll probably never get out of the hospital. I said, oh, my God. I'm sorry. What can I do? She goes, you can come and pick up your daughter is what you can do. I said, my daughter? I'm thinking of my older daughter. What's she doing up there? No, your, your baby. I said, what baby? She goes, you didn't know? I said, no, what? I said, she goes, you got a three-month-old daughter, and I'm not taking care of her. I said, really? She goes, yeah. I said, okay. I got in my car, and I drove up to Burbank. It was about 100 miles away. I knocked on this door. This lady opened the door, stuck this bassinet out, diaper bag. I'm looking at this baby. She grinned at me, and I fell in love. Man, my heart just exploded, and I, I got back home, and all the guys said, you better get a blood test, make sure that's your kid. I said, no, 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 this is my baby. God gave me this baby, and I ain't giving it back. I don't care who she is, <laughs> you know. And, uh, and I got to be a sober father again, and I got to experience absolute true love one more time in my life. Little Natalie Marie. She's going to be eight years old on New Year's Eve, and she's my baby. You know, it was just me and her for about a year, and we were at a meeting of Alcoholics Anonymous one night, and I took her. She was sitting in my lap, and there was this wonderful woman I've known for many years, and she said, can I hold your baby? I said, do you know how to hold a baby? <laughs> she said, give me that baby. And I gave her that baby, but I kept an eye on her, you know, and... Uh, I saw something. I saw something, a look in this woman that I'd never seen before. I'd known her for many, many years. And I saw something, and I fell in love. It was the way she was looking at my daughter. That's what I fell in love with. And I went up to her after the meeting, and I said, So, how's your husband, John? She goes, We got divorced two years ago. I said, Oh, God, I'm so sorry. What happened? <laughs> I said, Well, I wanted to have children, and he didn't. And I went, Really? You like children, do you? She goes, I've always wanted to be a mother. I went, wow. And that's her. <laughs> Miss Sabrina is the love of my life. She's my best friend. She's my lover. She's my business partner. She's the mother of my children. And we built a life in Alcoholics Anonymous that I wouldn't trade places with anybody in the human race. There's not one human being in this world that's got anything that I want. I got everything I want. Everything I've ever dreamed of. Six years ago, I got to go to a hospital and deliver a little boy and cut the cord and make him the same promises I made his brother. And I intend to keep those promises this time. I named him Will, because God's, God's will. I've got to know him. He's exactly like me. He's self-will run riot now. <laughs> I want to thank you and your indulgence and your patience of hearing all of this, but uh, my message is this. Recovery is possible for anybody. This program will work for absolutely anybody under any circumstances. It doesn't matter who you are what you are, where you've been, what you've done, what you haven't done. If you're willing to live by the principles, outline that. And surrender your life to the God of your understanding. You're going to get to experience every moment of your life. Now, it's not all good, but it's your life. And you don't have to miss any of it. You never have to run from anything again. I want to thank you for my life, and I want to thank you for the honor of being here tonight. Thank you. Thanks for listening. I hope you enjoyed the podcast. Sobercast is ad-free, and we'd like your help in order to keep it that way. So if you'd like to help us be self-supporting by pledging a dollar to a month, visit Sobercast.com and look for the donate links. Thank you very much.